The J Smart Podcast, everybody. Thank you very much. Listen, whatever you're doing, wherever you are, once again, genuinely, thank you for your company. With so many podcasts, with so much to watch and listen to these days, everybody's fighting for position, but really appreciate your time and you wanting to listen to this podcast. I don't blame if you do, because you've already seen who my guest is. If you haven't, my guest today is a star of, I mean, where do we even start? She has a whole list here. A star of stage and screen. She's a former model, huge health advocate, animal lover, magazine cover star, radio presenter, and a true and one of the very few genuine inspirations for all things health, fitness, and ethics. She's also got some pretty nifty dance moves, as I think we all saw on Strictly Come Dancing. I can, of course, only be talking about the second most famous Atkinson after ruin himself. Yes, no, it's Gemma Atkinson, everybody. Hey! Come on, let's get Thank you. So first up, I've got some good news, Gemma. Really, let's kick off the podcast with some really good news. Great and news. Good news is I've pressed record. Yay! So, so for those, so uh, just a little bit of background. I actually <laughs> recorded Gemma for a podcast episode a few months back. It was a really good podcast episode. And then realized after I hadn't press record. And of course, I didn't want to break it to Gemma straight away. So I thought, what can I do? I said, the files have been corrupted. I thought, <laughs> I, otherwise, I'm going to be in all kinds of trouble. And then I came clean about a few weeks ago. Like, I've got to be honest, I didn't press record. So there you go. So listen, the fact that you've agreed to come on again. Well, first of all, you agreed to come on the first place. was amazing. But secondly, you agreed to come on again after I did that. I thought I'd miss my one and only chance, Gemma. So listen, welcome. Welcome back, I suppose. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. It's good to see the little red light flashing. So we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've got quite a lot to get through. I mean, normally these podcast episodes are about half an hour, 40 minutes, something like that. But you've done so much. With some guests, it's kind of straightforward. But with you, there's just so much. And I suppose because this is a health and fitness podcast, I think we just right off the bat get into that stuff before we get into your incredible achievements over the years. And they all kind of link in with each other too. So First of all, have you always been into your health and fitness? Has it played a major role in your life or is it something that's recently come to the fore? Uh, it's, uh, do you know what? It's a bit of both, to be honest. In school, it was always there. It was all I was really good at, to be honest, in school. I mean, I got my GCSEs and I did okay. But anything to do with PE, I was there. I was sports captain of a lot of the teams. I of course was you talking were. all around us. I was like, come on, let's do it. Hated cross country, and I still do. I've never seen the point in running for so long. But I've just always thrived at sports. And then outside of school, I used to run for Manchester Girls Athletics team, which, again, I loved. But then Hollyoaks kind of came into my life and took over. So because we were filming such long hours, I missed out on a lot of the training that was required to be part of the athletics team. You know, we had to train three times a week at minimum. And I was lucky if I made one because I was filming in Liverpool. So it kind of took a back burner. And when I was filming Hollyoaks, it was a lot of nights out, McDonald's. It was basically like university, but, you know, you were working as well as it was a job. And I started to notice my appearance changing. And I, I don't mean as in, oh, I got fat because I've never been about in number. It was kind of like... My skin became quite spotty, my dark circles, my hair was not as healthy as it was. I was just feeling like, ugh. And it took me quite a while to realise, ah, it's because I'm not eating the way I used to. So it wasn't even so much about the lack of training from athletics. It was about the fuel that I was missing out on. Because before and after a training session, I always fueled well because I thought I'm going to be sprinting all night. I need to make sure I eat properly. But when I was filming... It was a case of grab what I could when I could. And it was anything like stopping on the motorway at the service station. And it just kind of all seemed to roll into one of, ah, I maybe need to get back onto health and fitness again. And it was, was that, through that realisation that I started making changes again. I was going to say, was that after? Because you was in Hollyoaks, I think, 2001 to 2005, around mm -hmm. that time. Was it the entire time you was at Hollyoaks that you kind of just felt over that four-year period, like you said, you're on the go? You're just grabbing some stuff. You're not really in a routine when it comes to food or even fitness at that point. And then afterwards, did you think, right, I need to get back on that game again? Yeah, it was kind of, I mean, for example, my typical breakfast, it was like an egg butty. Uh, <laughs> an egg butty, love. love. An egg, egg butty. butty. <laughs> and every tea break, and this is no joke, every tea break, I used to have a mintero every afternoon and wonder why for the rest of the afternoon I had a headache and was feeling just utterly crap and during filming Hollyoaks my dad passed away 
And my dad was, he was six foot, he didn't smoke, he didn't drink, you know, he maybe I didn't, if he went out with his mates or my mum, a, a drink at the weekend, but nothing, you know, yeah. too much. And he died of a heart attack through stress. He managed his own company and the, the doctor said it was stress that did it. And I kind of thought, wow, you know, we really need to take care of ourselves. So I think that was a moment as well where I was like, okay, I really need to watch what I'm doing now because I don't know if it does run in the family, but back then it was kind of, because I was only 17, I was saying to my mum, if it's happened to dad, it could happen to me. You know, you have all these kind of fears. So I then started making subtle changes, joined the gym, and it was the feeling it gave me. I didn't really notice the changes in my body shape or skin until way down the line, but the changes it gave me mentally were almost instant. And I was like, right, okay, I found what I want to do. This is incredible. This feeling that people are paying for, you can just get for free by exercise. And it's brilliant. I loved it. So much research has been done, as you're probably more than aware of, but in terms of physical activity, exercise linked with mental health issues, essentially. Even the top scientists said there isn't a pill on the planet that can do what physical exercise can do in terms of lifting your mental health. Now, we all know there's a challenge in that if somebody's genuinely depressed, which is a different ball game altogether, getting them on to exercise is very difficult as well. So there's a need for both things. But if you can be in a position where you can turn to good food and exercise, like you said, here's a feeling here that's essentially free. You know, and people say, oh, no, I can't afford to go to a gym. Everybody can exercise, no matter where they are, no matter what they're doing. And they can eat well as well. Other people say you've got to have a lot of money to eat well. And how much is a banana? You know, and you can... Well, that's the thing with my aero. I mean, that I used to have every afternoon was more and, expensive than my banana. That I've changed it to. And it's funny as well, because people from old school think, I mean, let's take the banana for an example. And they say, well... I remember having a conversation once saying, well, do you know how many calories are in a banana? Somebody said to me, I said, no, because I don't have any calories in anything. I don't count calories because it's interesting to observe. They were having, I think it was one of those granola bars from Starbucks or whatever it was at the time, which if they're a calorie person, that's about 250 and a banana is about hundred. And yet their brain would tell them, oh no, a banana is much worse than the granola bar. And you go, well, where did you hear that? I always go back to when I was on holiday with the girls once, one of my friends at the time, she was on a diet. And I, I just I hate the word diet. I just yeah. I just think it's you shouldn't have to do it. It's just about balance and things. But we went to this restaurant for a meal, which is really great, massive salad, avocado, so much goodness in it. And she brought out a bag it was her bag that she brought with her. And she's completely over this now, and she's really switched up, and she looks and feels great. But at the time, because the salad had around five hundred calories in it, <laughs> she went for this bar that, like you said, had less than two hundred. But there was no nutrition at all in that. You know, I was saying this bowl is full of goodness and you're going to feel amazing. And, you, you know, your body's going to thank you for eating this. You're going to eat that bar and you're just going to feel like crap. But she was so caught up on the calorie thing. Well, people still are to this day, Jim, which astonishes me because when you really drill down, you know, you haven't got to drill down too far to understand that we all burn calories in very different ways. All of our metabolisms are slightly different anyway, and it depends on the food itself, how much is usable, how much the body will extract, digest, expose the waste and so on. And also we're the only creatures on earth that count calories. And as you've just pointed out, an avocado uh, for years, I think it was one of these weight loss centers kind of chains that made everybody scared of avocados because they <laughs> contained fat. It's an extraordinary thing. But people are now obviously realizing, I think avocado, even to this day as we speak, is still now the most photographed image on Instagram. Me, actually, my daughter has avocado every day. She loves that. She eats it with a spoon like a little boiled egg. Kids, I've got little JJ as well, and it's interesting to see how his desires have changed now that he's passed three years old and other people sometimes look after him. And so, therefore, <laughs> you can't always be around exactly everything that they give because they think they're being kind, don't they? They think they're being oh, yeah. kind, but go, oh, go on, just have a bit of that. Go on, just have a bit of that. Yeah. And now all, of, chocolate all the time. And now all of a sudden he loved coloured food. <laughs> and he still does, but now he also likes beige, beige food. And, beige, like, beige oh. food. Yeah. and you're like, what, oh. what, has, what have other people done to it? But to revert back to the fitness for a minute, because you, you're really, I mean, you've got health and fitness. I mean, you eat well, and then every now and then you're human, which is great, which people love to see on your Instagram, yeah. because you're just honest. You're one of the very few honest people. I think that's why you've got such a huge following as well people understand that none of this is bs and you show your worst days your best days in between and but the physical exercise element of it is something that you are 
hundred percent focused on. Were you focused on it as much before? I mean, obviously you, I think you were, but obviously you and Gorks got together when you did Strictly Come Dancing, but cause he's really into his fitness. I mean, this guy's 3% body fat. Yeah. <laughs> Same. Yeah. Do you know what? I've, I've never met anyone as motivated as Gorka when it comes to his training. And a lot of people, because he's a dancer, obviously they have to be very physical anyway and they are fit. I mean, I always, I never realized how athletic dancers were until I did Strictly, until they'd have to do the group number over and over and over and over and none of them would break a sweat. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is insane. <laughs> but Gorka loves the weight training side of it. He's very much into CrossFit as well at the minute. He loves that. And people always say to him, are you not dancing? You know, and he's like, when, when he's not doing Strictly, the last thing he wants to do is dance. But he says it's vital for him to keep training, keep his body in tip-top shape. I guess it's like when a footballer's got off-season, a lot of them will still dabble in training because they don't want a hard time when they get back. It makes him feel amazing. He said nothing makes him feel better than just, even just 40 minutes. You don't have to do hours slogging it. 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and you're done. Well, it changes the brain chemicals. I mean, I was having a stressful time the other day, anyway, down at this build, anyway, along with Vol story, get back. And it's one of those, you have a choice, you're so tired, your blood sugar levels are on the floor and you're really peed off about because it happens to all of us. And you think, right, what should I do? Should I, what should I turn to, to change my state? That's effectively what it is. And lucky enough, my brain has enough references to know that actually if I jump on my spinning bike for 40 minutes, I know I'm going to feel all right. And I always say, if I still feel like this in 45 minutes, then I'll go and grab something to eat or yeah. whatever the case is. <laughs> but actually, let me, let me give myself that 45 minutes first, see how I feel. And every time, every time, yeah. of course, it changes the brain chemistry, you feel good. Now he's into weights. You were a runner. Are you more cardio? He's more weights or is it now? Because uh, on your body plan, which we'll get onto in a minute, you're, you're pretty much into weights as well, aren't you? Weight training? Yeah, I do love weight training. And I used to have a fear of weight training, uh, which a lot of women still do. I used to fear that I'd become bulky and look like a man. And when I got with my PT and I said to him, please don't make me too big. I don't want to look masculine. He literally nearly rolled around laughing. He was like, are you insane? He said, it's hard enough for a guy to look like a man. He says, and we have way more <laughs> testosterone than you. He said, you have, I think he said, look, we have an eighth of the testosterone required to build muscle. Oh, and and okay. I said, yeah, but you see women bodybuilders. And he said, they're not just doing, you know. No, they're, they're, they're having some other stuff. <laughs> yeah. He said, there's a lot more involved. He, he said, you can train as hard and as long as you like, but you will never, ever naturally look like a man. And that was about 10 years ago. And I'm still training hard and eating well. And I'm still, last time I checked, <laughs> not as much as the male bodybuilders. No, no, it's fair to say you don't look like a man, Jem. I think that's fair. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that is more than fair to say. 2018 saw the ultimate body plan, which absolutely stormed it. The, the, the intro is kind of like talking to people on a one-to-one -one basis of my story with health and fitness and how sometimes life, I think a lot of people assume if you do a certain job or you're in the public eye or whatever, that your life's always been incredible and fantastic. And I thought it was best to be honest and real about all the crappy stuff that's happened to me also and all the times I've messed up. Because if I've gone through all that stuff and still come out and done X, Y, and Z, I just think it's more realistic. I, I hate reading a book by someone and thinking, well, I'm never going to achieve that because you were born to millionaire parents and you've got servants. And of course, absolutely. It's not achievable. But if I read one of someone who actually had the same upbringing and childhood and issues that I had, but has turned it around and saying, oh, right, at least they can do it. You know, I can do it. I, I saw a quote from, it was an Olympian, and he said, you don't want to diet and exercise. You want to train fuel. And I thought, that's yeah, exactly nice. what it is. It's about training your body to do what it can, even if it's just a brisk walk daily. It doesn't have to be throwing weights around, just getting out walking and fueling it to perform at optimum level. And I thought that's what it is. It's fueling as opposed to dieting. So that's the, the message that we drew in the book. And that's what the ultimate body plan's about. I don't know if it's out already or it's, you know, it's released in 2020. Could you do an ultimate body plan for new mums as well? Are you, are you doing? Yeah, that's yeah, out do. next April. It should have been out this April, but because of the pandemic, we couldn't yeah. do the photo shoots for all the exercises. <laughs> I was going to try and push past the old pandemic, but it's very difficult to do that, obviously, because even at yeah. time of recording, there's still elements of it still going on. And who knows, you might listen to this in five years' time, and who knows, some of the restrictions <laughs> might not have been lifted. But on that note, without getting political, because we don't need to, but just a genuine opinion on this, because I know what mine is, and I haven't hidden it, in terms of, I'm always going to look back, I think. I mean, in fact, I know. I'm always going to look back and think, Jim's closed things like health retreats closed, McDonald's, Burger King, and Pizza Hut open. In a health epidemic where we know now 
it's clear that 78 to 80 percent of people and this isn't fat shaming in any way shape or form because there's addiction involved and everything else but if you were for whatever reason unlucky enough to be overweight or obese for argument's sake 80 percent of people that were hospitalized or unfortunately passed with covid were overweight or obese without that there isn't an epidemic now Again, not picking on those far from it. I used to be there myself and I understand all the complications, particularly addiction that comes with that. But then I never saw once, you know, save the NHS, eat veg and exercise. I never saw that. I must have missed it. I don't know where I missed it. But they now know that the transmissions in gyms were non-existent, essentially. So they needn't have closed the gyms. And it's all that knee-jerk stuff. If they needed to close the gyms, fair enough. But it seemed odd that they still had McDonald's and stuff like that open. I don't know how you felt about it. Did it frustrate you a little or not? I don't know. Yeah, it frustrated me a lot because where we live in a little village there's a little um fruit and veg store and it's a little family run fruit and veg business and every morning they're out there shutters open selling fresh fruit and veg for people and during the pandemic i used to drive past all the shutters were closed a mile up the road you've got your kfc drive to open and i was just like how how you know why is no one educating people it's not about shaming them because no one wants to feel ashamed about how they look or like you say the unfortunate circumstances they've gotten themselves into through either habits from parents or things that have happened. But rather than think to people, you can fix this by simply taking, you know, for example, a headache tablet, when probably you're dehydrated, drink some water. It baffles me that there's no education out there. And I think it should start in schools when it comes to, you know, things like just human skills in school. Like you say, picking good foods and how it's beneficial for you and keep an eye contact with someone when you're speaking. That, for me, is more important than trying to figure out Pythagoras theorem, you know? Yeah. Have um, you ever used Pythagoras theorem? I've never, never used it. Ever never. Since I, or, I don't, I don't, I've never once wondered what an isosceles triangle was after I left. No. Or a but, like, if you go into a, a business meeting with someone, you want to be able to connect with them properly, using your manners, then using theirs. And then you have, you know, your food platter of good food come in if you're lucky enough to have that. And when Mia started nursery, one of the first questions I asked was, what do you feed them? Because yeah. I, I inquired that with every nursery. I didn't want them to come home hyper and, you know, going crazy. And she said each nursery has its own chef. None of the sauces are jars. Oh, They're wow. all made. On, so everything's made fresh. They only drink water and they only have fruit. There's, there's nothing, That's fantastic. No chocolate bars or anything like that. And I'm not saying she's never going to have that. I mean, gosh, she goes to my mum's for the afternoon. She yeah, exactly. comes on covered in chocolate. <laughs> but when she's at nursery learning, yeah. you know, I want her to be eating well. Well, life skills, as you just pointed out there in school, are vital. And I don't understand. I think this is, I guess, all governments, Not, I'm not just talking about any particular political party, all governments during this time that we've gone through with this COVID situation. There's not one, no matter what country you look at, they didn't say, and I know I keep repeating it, but they never said, eat veg, move your body, save the NHS, or you can actually put some of this into your own hands. And it's always been, no, 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 it doesn't matter what you eat, it doesn't matter what you drink. In fact, it's never mentioned. I mean, none of it was ever mentioned oh, at all. Is which is an incredible thing. Dr. Asima Holtra, who I did a podcast with a uh, top cardiologist, and he's been very vocal with all this throughout this whole thing. And, and he said it's more a metabolic disease than a virus. And, and again, that gets a little bit controversial. But what he's saying, of course, is that like anything else, if you're under attack, well, how strong are your defenses? It's a very good point. And by giving the impression that actually we can't do anything about it or it makes no difference what you eat or drink, which is the impression they give. And then people think, well, why bother then? I think there's at the back of this, I don't know if you're finding it, Gemma, as well, a lot of people that follow you and your body plan, everything else, as we come out, which is the time of this recording, people are starting to focus a lot now on their health thinking, actually, this is important. Or they've drunk too much, they've eaten too much, they've done this, again, not through, you know, they've just been stuck in their houses and stuff. But now they can get out, they can move. So things like the ultimate body plan are going to become so vital for people. Yeah, I think people have realised now the importance of self-care. And I think when you were saying about things not being said, my personal opinion is that I think there's a lot of fear of offending people. And I think when you're in a position where you're a doctor or a nurse, that should be the least of your worries. One of my closest friends, uh, Mickey, she's lost 10 and a half stone. She was morbidly wow. obese. Mickey. Yeah. And she just said no one really told her the dangers and she wasn't really aware. And she said it was one doctor who turned it around for her. And she said, he just point blank said to her, if you carry on the way you are, you're going to die. He said, you will die, like, literally within year, two years. And she said that was kind of, what, really? And he was like, yeah. And literally from that moment she came out, she's got a book, she used to be on Hollyoaks, actually. And she actually said from that moment she was like, I'm done. 
and she just stopped and look 15 years now and she's lost 10 and a half stones that's, and she's, that is incredible. that's she's human. never looked back but she just said it was that fear and no one had given her because she said no one ever said to her you're fat or you're obese or you're overweight yeah. it was just a case of well you're choosing to eat this so this is happening and it was the hard cut advice she said that just hit her straight and I think nowadays there's a a fear of doing that because you don't want to upset or offend anyone but when their life is on the line sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind because ultimately you want that person to be here and enjoying their life well in exactly the same way it's, it's funny because i think i guess obesity food addiction is the last bastille of being able to say something in the sense that smokers now there's nothing wrong with you telling a family member look i'm really worried about you. you're smoking i don't want you to die right that's fine we've yet to see that with food but if it's a family member or somebody you care for, there is a way I think you can approach the subject. You know, you're not doing this because, hey, why don't you do this because you'll look better? That's not the issue here. If the government's message a year ago was all this, then can you imagine if they banned all the junk food for a year, not all forever, but just went, look. It's a completely different place now. A completely different place. And it's funny because, like you said, people are scared of offending people. I put up some posts, Gem, during this time, just rationally questioning things i've been on the firing line as well no not in any conspiracy theories where i don't know where the line is between critical thinking and conspiracy theories i mean now you're not allowed to have any opinion at all on this subject it makes you a crackpot david ike fan which isn't the case right but how we reach the point though that we are the only vehicle that we don't really question the fuel you use the word in the right capacity if you had your car and it was a petrol car and you started putting in diesel everybody would quite rightly start shouting at you going what are you doing you idiot it's going to seize up right <laughs> Yeah. I mean, look, I eat the wrong things. So do you, Gem, every now and then. I mean, we're a yeah. human, right? Oh, I always think I'm 80% what my body needs and 20% what I want. That, for me, is what See, I works. like that. The 80-20 ratio is absolutely perfect. I mean, a lot of people listening to this would be relieved as well. They think it's all or nothing, but we're human. Yeah, and I think food is there to be enjoyed as well. I mean, Gorka's Spanish family, it's a whole thing. I mean, you're not living in Spain. They yeah. make a massive deal out of all sitting at the table together, all eating a big lunch together. It's a social event as well, so it doesn't have to just be chicken and broccoli forever, amen. That's like the last <laughs> thing we want to eat. But it's, it's just about finding we're talk, the we're talking. We're talking of that. Did you become a vegetarian? I, I, I read somewhere you did. Uh, yes. Maybe you're not now. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know no, where you, where been, you are um, at that. I've been vegging now. I've not had any red meat for around 10 years. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And I stopped fish and chicken coming up to two years. So, yeah. Oh, I'm, fish, I'm, fish as well. So you're not even a pescatarian. Yeah. You're not, not even a pesky person. Not even a pesky, I'm full on veggie. I'm one of those. <laughs> you're, and you're an unusual veggie. Do you know why? Because you actually eat vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's true, right? I've had a lot of messages saying, what do you eat being veg? How do you get your protein? That's the one question. Well, it's funny. I've got a couple of questions here from people when I, when I put it out and said, any questions for Gem or whatever? And one of them was, well, she does a lot of training. You know, now she's a vegetarian. Where does she get her protein? Well, I think I always say to people, like, fish is a source of protein, but so are chickpeas and lentils and kidney beans and tofu. I think people seeing that the only source of protein on this planet is chicken or beef or fish whereas if you look into lots of food sources of protein there's so many that don't have to come from an animal and that for me I mean I thought about going veggie a long long time ago but I didn't research it enough so I just poo-pooed it but when I sat down and looked into it and like you say looked at the options I eat and cook better now than I ever did because there's just so much variety that I didn't even know about and obviously everyone's different their food choices are their own but for me personally, I've had more energy as well since cutting out meat. I don't know if that's a thing for a lot of people or just for me. You know, well, a lot of people, it's great. interesting Interesting to observe. I've been doing this for nearly 25 years now. And, and over the time, obviously, every five years, there's a new distinction or even you change your mind. I do about stuff that I'd even written about 25 years ago. And I come to the conclusion that I think humans are like dinosaurs in a way. Dinosaurs, there were carnivorous dinosaurs, there were herbivore dinosaurs, and they, you know, even the herbivores had big muscles. And yeah. you just and you just go, well, I know some of my friends, particularly males, although I'm not, I think, because I have no, probably no testosterone. So I can't put up a shelf, but I can iron, which is good. So, so yeah. Kate, Kate puts up the shelves for us, but I'm, I thrive on plant food. I, I'm okay with plant food. I know I am. I do eat fish, but I, I don't require it. I don't feel that I require it in order to get protein because it's only amino acids one avocado has all nine essential amino acids which is the building blocks of protein which is all you really need anyway and throw a few seeds in and we don't need anywhere near as much protein as we think but there's some friends of mine who guys in particular i've seen them go vegetarian 
and uh, or what one of them went vegan as well, and they weren't themselves at all. Well, actually, maybe he, when he went vegetarian, he didn't actually do vegetarian. He did what most people do, which is carbarian, I call it, yeah. which is actually just to go, well, I can't understand Well, I'm still overweight and I'm still ill. But yeah, I, you know, I've gone vegetarian. You go, well, what are you eating? Well, rice, pasta, bread. <laughs> and you go, have you got any vegetables there? It's, no. I think it's what's drilled into people as well. Like when it comes to your own children, an example is Mia's never had cow's milk in life. And I know some people go, what? I don't drink cow's milk. I haven't done for years. Yeah, but why and do they? It's an interesting thing to pick up on that. Why do they say what? I mean, what you know? Why would why, why, why would why yeah. would you say if you found a different species, okay, and <laughs> you said to them, "How come you've never had cow's milk?" <laughs> and you spoke to a different species than a cow, they would say, "Because I'm not a cow or a calf." When she was born, I was bre- I breastfed her for as long as possible. I think I did around nine, ten weeks of breastfeeding. Then she went on to formula, and then when she was weaning, it was drilled into me by Lots of other mums, health practitioners, you know, and I'm not, obviously you must take the advice of health people, absolutely. But for me personally, because I don't drink cow's milk, I thought I'm not going to give to Mia what I don't have myself because of reasons why I don't drink it. And they were telling me if she does not have the cow's milk, her bones won't form properly. She's at risk of injury if she falls, all these things. And in my head, I'm thinking she'd been breastfeeding from me for nearly three months, whatever. Why would I then go and put her under a cow's udder? You know, why? <laughs> it, it's kind of, it kind of didn't sit well with me that it's not natural for myself as a human to go and drink milk from a cow. So I'm always oat, almond, coconut, any alternatives. And and what did you yeah. mix with it? Because for JJ, we had avocado, banana, water, a little bit of cucumber juice, bits like that. And we yeah. did that. And that was, oh, little milky is what we'd call it. And although Kate managed to breastfeed for actually quite a while, but then at some point you've got to wean off and go. And it's that's the question, isn't it? What do we do? Do we fall under the pressure of everybody else saying, I'm going to get a little bone disease, going to do this? There'll be some people screaming at this podcast <laughs> already. I mean, look, up until the age of three, just so we know, we have two enzymes, renin and lactase. Okay. So even if a child has goat's milk, cow's milk, it has got the enzymes at least to break those down. People can think this is a controversial conversation right now, but whichever way you cut it, we are the only adult mammals that still drink milk after weaning age. And that's why I put a covenant in there and saying, look, okay, even if it's up to the age of three, if you're fearful or whatever. Yeah. And it's that, kind of like you can get advice from everybody, but ultimately you and Kate know what you want to do with JJ and how you want to bring him up and, you know, what you want to feed him. And that's the same with me and Mia. And my mum said to me, you know, you and Gork have to make these choices for her because, you know, you're a parent. So take the advice. And obviously it's, I'm no doctor at all. But for me personally, I knew the reasons why I didn't drink cow's milk and the benefits from me not having it. So I was not going to make Mia drink it because I was told I had to from research from years and years and years back. And touch wood no. so far, she's absolutely fine. She's, you know, she's thriving. She's great. Yeah. What hits the headlines every now and then, Gem, you will see is that, you know, you see a baby who literally is withering away or whatever the case is. And I remember one last year where they said, oh, the parents, there was no animal products and all they've done is give them almond milk. Now we don't know the full story behind that. And clearly they might not have given them anything else, um, which, which obviously if you only drink almond milk and nothing else, you know, or didn't eat yeah. anything else or do yeah. anything else, then of course you're probably in trouble, but that's the headline you see. You know, that's why I get frustrated. I mean, my first ever book that I wrote over 20 years ago, I said, you know, even cows don't drink milk. And that was one of the headlines that I put. And it's one of those that sometimes people read that and they think, oh, actually maybe there's something in it. That doesn't mean that you cannot, and for those listening, just to be clear, that doesn't mean your body cannot put up with a certain amount of anything, as, as Gem's even alluded to, 80-20 rule, 100% every time. And the body works on that same ratio, more or less, even 70-30, to be quite frank. Yeah, it can still course. thrive. It can still really thrive on that. And it means that we were designed that if anything that wasn't ideal for the human body went into our body, we can still easily survive and still easily thrive. But it's all about the ratio. What you do most of the time determines your weight and health. And that's what we're talking about here, just in case we get we get tons of letters after this. Go, oh, you, you can imagine the headline kind. Jim Atkinson says, "Don't give me up to babies." And this is yeah, this is what they do. Anyway, listen. So I want to get back to Strictly Come Dancing. Obviously, there's so much to cover, and your appearance. We were in a little boat together on the River de Desiree in the middle of Portugal. 
right? Mm. Which was a beautiful day. And I think you just found out that you were going to be on Strictly and you were so excited. Like you weren't meant to tell anybody. I felt really blessed on two fronts. A, you told me, but B, you trusted me enough to tell me. And you knew I wouldn't tell anybody, which was great. So like I didn't. And, and you made, and you made the decision there, didn't you? You made the decision there, didn't you? You read the book. Was it Oprah Winfrey book or something? You was at Juicy oh, Oasis. You, what was the story again? Yeah. I've been asked to do Strictly and I said no. I, I just said to me, it's, it's too big, 15 million people watch it. I can't, it's too much pressure. And they came back and asked again and she was like, just think about it, it's a great opportunity. I was happy doing the radio just because I could live at home and 20 minutes into work. She said, listen, just think about it, it's a big deal. And I booked to come to your Juicy Retreat in Portugal with my mum and stepdad Peter and said, look, I'm going to Jason Vales that's the, the one place on the planet where I can just sit and think and be. And if anything comes to me, we'll just go with it. I said, just leave me to have a week. So I came to your retreat and I remember thinking, I'm going to have my phone off all week. And in the rooms where we stayed at your retreat, there was a book, an Oprah Winfrey book. And I just casually flipped it open. And on the page I opened it on, all it said was, if you have a chance to sit it out or dance, I hope you choose to dance. Oh. And I kind of went, oh. And I told my mom, and she said, well, that's kind of a sign, Gemma. So I was like, right, yeah. So I text my agent, and I, was, I said to her, I'm in for Strictly. Don't ask me again, though, because I might change my mind. But, yeah, Oprah says I should do it, so I'm going to do it. And she was like, what? <laughs> Sent the message, turned my phone off. A day later, went on a boat trip with you, told you I was doing Strictly, and the rest is history. Well, it really is. That's a beautiful quote, by the way. Again, I mean, yeah, it, for everything, unbelievably relevant to what you were about to do, obviously. What was it? If you got a chance to sit? If you, if you have a chance to sit it out or dance, I hope you choose to dance. It's a, it's a really lovely, and actually that's just helped because I'm, <laughs> this build that I'm going through as well, I, I wish I'd sat it out, to be honest. Oh, no, yes, um, dance but, on it. But, but actually, is that true? Would I reach the end and think, you know, I'm glad I sat it out? I wouldn't. I think if you no. dance, you're always, it's one of those, there's two, there's two kinds of people in life, I think there's two, I'm I'm writing a little book called what if, and it's what if it goes wrong? What if it goes right? And the majority of people are, well, you know, well, I would buy the house, but what if that happens? Well, I would go for the new job, but what if that happens? Well, I would do that, but what if that happens? And it tends to be the, the negative what ifs. And there's 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 a bunch of people that go, yeah, but what if it goes right? It's kind of, I'd, I'd rather say, oh, well, than what if, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, I'd rather try and go, oh, well, then oh, what if I'd have done it? And it's the whole, you know, people say, oh, your glass is half empty, your glass is half full, tight. you're an optimist person. I always think it doesn't matter about any of that because the bottom line is the glass is refillable. So whether you're oh, so God. positive about something and it goes wrong or so ne- negative about something and it goes right, whatever side you're on, you can start afresh anyway. Just refill the glass. It doesn't matter. It's that simple like for that. me. And what a sliding door moment that was. I mean, not only, I mean, you think about the knockout effect because everything's a sliding door moment, right? Obviously. Mm-hmm. And you go, right, if that had happened, then that wouldn't happen. Everything's a core set emotion. But the fact that you, like you said, read that one quote from Oprah, right? And then, <laughs> and then made that decision that day and then just went ahead with it meant you look at the knock-on effect, not just the how brilliant you were on Strictly uh, and all of that and that wonderful experience, but the fact that you met Gork there. And of course, you got a little Mia. I mean, this is the biggest sliding door in the world. And it's mad because I didn't even dance with Gork. That's what's crazy about it. I mean, I danced with, with Aliash, so we rehearsed in Manchester and Gorka rehearsed in London. So I only saw Gorka on the live shows on Saturdays. And I then it was Gorka. Yeah. I thought you I thought you danced with Gorka. I didn't see the show. I apologize, no, but no, but, I didn't uh, yeah. dance with him. So we saw each other at the live shows on Saturday. But when we went on tour in the new year, that's when I started, you know, I saw him every day because we were all on tour together. And it was during the live show, they used to like think, oh, yeah, he's quite attractive. But I think, I don't know if it's something with age or because I've met loads of attractive lads over the years. But I just, I was at the stage where it took a lot more than someone just being fit for me to go, yeah, come on, let's let's go. Well, I was going to say, I mean, of- let, I mean, let's be fair. Of course, it would take much more than somebody being fit. I mean, you went out with Ronaldo as well, you know, so I mean, let's be fair, you know, because actually that was one of the things in, in Portugal when you came, by the way. So when he was turning up for the first time, we didn't know each other. But the guy that was working on our reception, Portuguese fella, after you checked it, he went, do you know who that is? Do you know who that is? And I was like, yes. Oh, so you know. I said, how do you know her? She goes, Ronaldo. <laughs> so- oh, brilliant. Do you know what's funny? I get Ronaldo in Portugal. And it's funny because you mentioned him in the intro. I got upgraded in Thailand once because it was on Wikipedia that my dad was Warren Atkinson. <laughs> the, the, 
<laughs> you're, and obviously, my dad isn't Rowan Atkinson. No, I was going to say. Do you know what you nearly threw me? Then I thought I've done some research for this podcast, but I didn't no, realise that Rowan I got Atkinson. upgraded to this really posh room in the Thailand resort, and they were, the staff couldn't do enough for me. And I was like, "Oh my god, the staff here is so beautiful and polite." And as I was leaving, one of them asked how my dad was. And I said, I said he, he passed away when I was yeah. 17, but thanks I for said, asking. Um, last time I checked, he wasn't doing too well. Why? <laughs> they said, what do you mean? I said, well, he, he died. And the look of horror on their face, they were like, oh, my God. And they were so upset. And in the end, I said, I'm really sorry. I'm not sure why it's affected you yeah. that much. And they spun their laptop around in reception and they pointed to Rowan Atkinson and said, he's died. I said, no, <laughs> Rowan Atkinson's not died. No, he's not my dad. <laughs> Oh, but it that was on is... Wikipedia, and that was the reason they upgraded me. Oh, um, my... So I, I might use that in the future when I go somewhere. I might send Rowan Atkinson's daughter. Do you know what? It's really good to use rumours. We did it at Juicy Oasis. There was a rumour going around. Just near there is a wonderful medieval village called Dornesh. People come from all over the world yes. to go there. Beautiful little place. And it was rumoured in all the newspapers that Barack Obama, when he was president, was coming to that place. And they said the only place to stay in the area at all is Juicy is in the middle of nowhere, so he must be going to Juicy Oasis. I thought, well, it's news to me. I didn't know he was coming. Anyway, so it happens to be April Fool's Day, and we thought we'd have a little place. We found an image of him in some swimming shorts, the only one that we could use, coming out of our swimming pool. We just photoshopped Brilliant. it. And uh, we just went, unfortunately, news has got out. Barack Obama has had to leave because of these rumours and for his security purposes, but, you know, da-da-da-da-da. And I said, for the full story, click here. And when you click through... It had Donald Trump going fake news. Right now, <laughs> now, the, now, now, the, now the problem is, is that most people are headline readers, so they never click through. So wow. I've had people come uh, over the years, every year at least. There's got to be 20, 40 people who say, "Oh, I can't believe Barack Obama is here." And you I, want to see in that room? And, I, and I'm like, "Yeah, I can't believe that either." So there you go. And there's all kinds of rumors. Oh, Ed Sheeran's been. Uh, he hasn't, but I'll keep the rumor going. I'm not bothered. Yeah, keep that one going. But, but there you go. You've got to keep it going. Right. Just a quick 10 questions here, just to run through these. We need a second episode of the podcast because I haven't touched on so many. I mean, there's a billion things, but health and fitness was the main focus. So that's good. You're busy inspiring other people, but who do you turn to for your inspiration? Cliche, but probably my mum for everything, really. I just think she's a great mum to me and my sister. She's the one who keeps me feet on the ground. If I get an amazing job or opportunity, she'll be like, right, but, you know, remember us when you come back. She's very, just no airs and graces with my mum. And I think if I'm half the mum she is, then I'll be pleased with that. I'll oh, that's tick for me. It's not cliche. Anybody who's got a close relationship, and I know your mum, she's wonderful. And the thing is, is that, of course, anybody with a close relationship with their mother knows that that's it. They're the, they're the first person you call, aren't they? They're the first, yeah, anything happens, pick up the phone, there they are. This is an interesting question. What elements need to happen for you to feel like you've had a success? successful day um I'd, I'd like to come home from a, a day and think I've achieved something even if it's just something really simple like making someone laugh at work or taking the mind off something that they're going through getting home when my petrol lights on reserve but I've still made it home you know little <laughs> little things little little tiny accomplishments it doesn't have to be a massive big gesture for me I like making lists of things like in the day I have a tick list like the start of today was Jason Vale I had that on my list so when this is done I'll tick it off it's it's that slowly steadily you know you don't have to do everything all at once and I've learned that the hard way because when I've tried to please everyone, try to do everything all at once, I've realised everyone around me is at peace and I'm in pieces trying to make sure everything's going yeah. and moving and you can't do that. So sometimes an accomplished day is just a day where you've not achieved so much, but you're at peace and you feel happy and relaxed and you've got your little girl and your fiancé across the living room and all's well. And that for me is a successful day. Yeah, because some people deem that certain things must happen, you know, like I must have eaten this, I must have exercised X amount, I must have done this, but it's a feeling success, isn't it, at the end of the day? Yeah. So, put any advice for an 18-year-old Gemma Atkinson? Just to do what you want to do without shame or embarrassment or anything. Just go for it. I think there was a time before social media came out, I used to get quite upset over newspaper articles because nowadays if there's an article out that's not true or something that's quite dangerous and the writing's really bad and you think I didn't say that I don't believe that you can correct it all on your Instagram or your Twitter you can say this article's out but in fact this is what I really said you can call people out from Hollyoaks up until I was like 25 26 there was none of that so for a good 10 years of being in this industry it was the media and you had no voice you had no comeback unless you did a shoot which again they're controlling 
So yeah, I went yeah. I went through a phase of every headline I used to think that every single person would believe and every single person would hold against me. And that was one of the reasons why I think my family and my agency were saying, do strictly so people can see what you're like as a person. And now with social media, like you say, you have your own voice and platform. You can put people right. But when that wasn't an option, it used to affect me a lot. So from age 18 to like 25, that was the time. It was like, oh gosh, I can't show my face. I go and put petrol in my car and I said, what to pay? I'd see my face on the paper with a headline that wasn't true. And I'd be so embarrassed because I tell the 18 year old not to be embarrassed, not to be ashamed because it's so fickle and it's just paper and you're going to be all right. And you say to her, don't worry, social media is coming. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, can all, you can call them all out in your own you time. Can, yeah. And also 1.6 million just on Instagram alone. You've got, so you really can put it right because most of these newspapers have a readership of about 300,000 now. Yeah. So, you, so all of a sudden you have a much higher readership <laughs> than most newspapers in the country, which is an astonishing thing. When you think about that turnaround, you own a bigger platform that will be read the most of the newspapers that used to write about you. And it's a wonderful kickback, really. I think it's brilliant. Karma comes back around, you see. A few on health and fitness really quick, because I know times it's against us now. How often do you juice? I mean, I don't know whether you juice all the time or whether it even plays a part. I know you juice when you come on Juicy Oasis because you have no yes, choice. I but... love juicing. I, uh, do you know what? When I had, uh, I had my emergency C-section with Mia, the first thing I did when I came out, I got your, your seven-day juice stuff delivered to the house because, again, it was a case of resting up, all about recovering, internal scar tissue, whatever. So it was, again, nutrients, nutrients, nutrients. So I did the seven-day juice diet, and it was brilliant because I couldn't move about, really, because of my scar, because I'd obviously had... No, you went through... Time. Yeah, I mean, both so, Kate and yourself went through... It was a nightmare. I mean, yeah. it sounds like one of the most terrific nightmares. But on the back of it now, Mia, I mean, you're like, you yeah. couldn't be happier, right? You would have had that emergency C-section all day long if you knew at the Absolutely. end of it. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah. So, okay. So you guys have a juice a day or not really? It's just like you do a plan. And because I know a lot of people who just literally do a plan, but then they don't have a juice at any other time because they eat really well. I love a juice. If I'm out and about and there's a, a, a juice shop, you know, someone selling fresh juice or whatever, I'm there every, if I'm, you know, I'll take fresh juice over anything. I've got a smoothie next to me at the minute. That's kale and spinach and frozen berries and avocado and all sorts of stuff in it. But I do. Oh. I like to start my mornings with a juice. Well, and that's a ginger nice. shot. You got me on the ginger shots as well. Well, I did. Yeah, I take the credit for the ginger shot, but but it's not me. People say, "Oh, you've invented the ginger shot." I didn't. It was a guy called Casper who owns or used to own Joe and the Juice. I don't know if you know the chain Joe and the Juice. Right. Things we haven't talked about. We haven't got time to. I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. Master Chef, so star, superstar, <laughs> Calendar Girls, all of the Peter Pan. Didn't even know that you was in Peter oh, Pan yeah. as well. How to stop being a loser? I didn't know you started. Hang on. This I have to do this. This can't be for next time. Starting a room romantic comedy called How's That Being a Loser alongside Richard E. Grant. Richard E. Grant, Martin Compson was in it as well. Pamela Anderson. All right, I'm going to go look for that. Where can I watch that? <laughs> Airborne, another film. Night of the Living Dead. Yeah. Got to check out these films. so many Brit films. And again, but this was all before I was like active on social media. So it took me a while to join social media. I think I was maybe four years late to join. Right, yeah. Even yeah. on Facebook. And all my mates at school were saying, you should get on Facebook. We can all chat. I said, I don't want to chat. I'm good. <laughs> but then when I did get on it, it was like, you got hooked like everyone else. So I was a bit You do school. get hooked, do you? How, how many times a day do you look at your phone? Or, you, or you're good at Too that? Too much. You, yeah, it, we all do. I try to turn it off from eight o'clock in the evening. So from seven, eight in the evening, I'd like to keep it off if I can. Um, and I try not to get on till 10 in the morning. But sometimes it's it's a bit earlier. Well, it's hard because your your alarm's on your phone as well, isn't it? So it's a bit yeah. tricky. So then you have to reach for your phone, and then all of a sudden you see you haven't turned off the notifications, and you can't possibly have notifications turned on on your Instagram. You would all it would do oh, is ping every it's second. Reminders. I use my phone for reminders instead yeah. of my paper diary. I, so every every throughout the day there's a reminder. I say, oh God, I should have done this. I should have done that. You know, it's mad. Well, look, when this is over, right, when this is almost over, which is good, then you've got to get yourself, obviously, with Gorks, over to Juicy, back to Juicy, yeah, and have a bit of a blast. And when, not if, when, he says, with tentative voice now, Juicy Escape ever opens. <laughs> it will. It'll be worth it. And you know what I would say to you about that, Jace? Obviously, you and Kate are taking it all on now, and it's the stress now. But the amount of people whose lives will change from coming to that retreat, from my first time alone at Juicy Oasis in Portugal, I was a completely different person when I was leaving with oh, the mindset, thanks, with knowledge, everything. I was like, wow, this was incredible. Just from seven days, 
I really appreciate that. I just hope that Kevin Costner's correct. If he isn't, I'm going to hold him personally responsible. <laughs> you know, he said, if you build it, they will come. Well, the little git better be right. Um, because it is, you know, they say whatever doesn't uh, kill you makes you stronger. Well, I'm waiting for the muscles to build because <laughs> I've just got back. And I'm like, this, the, the stress is huge. And that's going to sit with me today. That wonderful quote that changed many parts of your life as well from Oprah Winfrey. Let's leave it at that. So what was it again? Final time. If you have a chance to sit it out or dance, I hope you choose to dance. Gemma Atkinson, everybody. Thank you very much for coming on. Gemma Atkinson, thank you very much.